Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to flip through this book and read to you about Ireland. Let's get right into it. Here's where Ireland is located in the world. Here we go. Forty Shades of Green. The lush green fields of Ireland have earned the country a famous nickname, the Emerald Isle. The fertile landscape results from a combination of Ireland's rich limestone soils and its wet but mild climate. Ireland is located on an island at the most westerly edge of Europe. The island is as far north as Labrador and Canada, but it is much less chilly. Ireland enjoys mild weather thanks to the Gulf Stream a warming ocean current that arrives from Florida. The water around the island is warm enough to keep away icy weather systems from the Arctic. Ireland has not always had a mild climate. During the last ice age, about 15,000 years ago, the country was covered in glaciers. Sheets of ice that gouged out many of the landscape's more rugged features. An island called Ireland. There's often confusion about the land of Ireland because the name can apply to more than one place and country. The island of Ireland is the second largest island in Europe. The other main island in this group is Great Britain to the east of Ireland. Ireland is divided between two countries. Just over 80% of the land makes up the Republic of Ireland or Ere. The other 20% in the northeast is Northern Ireland. This is part of the United Kingdom, along with England, Wales, and Scotland. A rich landscape. The landscape of the Republic of Ireland is made up of lowland areas, which are mainly fields surrounded by rocky hills and mountains. In many places, the land is covered by damp peat bogs. The bogs and drier soils cover a bedrock of limestone. This rock helps to make Ireland's soils very fertile for growing crops and grass for cattle and sheep. One of the richest pastures is the Golden Vale, a large lowland spreading across the counties of Limerick, Tipperary, and Cork. Exposed Stone In some places, the limestone bedrock comes above the surface. This is what happens in the Burren region located along the western coast in County Clare and County Galway. The burn stretches over 140 square miles. Much of the area has no soil, but it is covered by a pavement of limestone. Plants grow in the cracks or grikes between the flat rocks, which are known as clints. In some places, the limestone has been forced up by a tectonic activity to a height of over 1,000 feet. The burn's limestone is up to 2,600 feet thick in some parts was formed 340 million years ago when the area was at the bottom of a warm, shallow sea. Over the years, a deep layer of shells from dead corals, shellfish, and plankton built up on the seabed. These shells were gradually squeezed into solid rock. Over the years since, the burn's rocks have been eaten away by ice and water, and there are many hundreds of small caves. With so much natural shelter around, the burn has a long history of habitation. There are dozens of prehistoric stone buildings in the area. Cliffs and craggy peaks. Ireland has some highland regions. Most of them are in the west and south and end with dramatic cliffs that plunge into the ocean. Just three Irish peaks are over 3,280 feet, or 1,000 meters, all of which are in the McGillicuddy's Rakes Range in County Kerry in the far southwest. Island Slabs The island of Valencia in Kerry's Dingle Bay is famous for its slate. The huge quarry has been working since 1816 and is now several miles across. The island slate has been shipped around the world. It was used to tile the British Parliament building in London, and it even ended up in the track beds of the San Salvador Railroad in Central America. In touch with nature. 
The Irish have great affection for nature and for rural life, and animals play a significant role in their legends and traditions. A sign of Ireland's link to the natural world is in its coins. Most countries put people on their money, such as kings or presidents, but the first Irish coins from the 1920s had animals on them. Some people objected to the decision. They thought that the coins should reflect Ireland's Christian religion, not older traditions. The animals chosen were typical of Ireland's farms and countryside. For example, a penny had a chicken, and the sixpence had a wolfhound, an Irish dog breed. A salmon was on the two-shilling coin, and a horse was on the half-crown. Ireland now uses the euro currency, so these coins are gone, but the close bond between the Irish and the natural world remains. Horse crazy. The Irish love horses. It is not clear how or when horses came to Ireland, but archaeological excavations in the Boyne Valley show that horses played an important role in Ireland's earliest settlements. Two breeds of horses have been identified as originating in Ireland. Bog ponies were bred for work in the peat industry. Peat was traditionally cut by hand. The bog was so muddy that small ponies were used to haul out the turf without sinking. Bog ponies grew only 14 inches tall. They were also tough, so they did not panic if they got stuck in the mud. When tractors replaced ponies, the bog breed began to die out. There are now just 130 bog ponies in Ireland. The second Irish breed is the Conmara pony from the west of County Galway. The history of this breed dates back to the time of the Celts. 2,400 years ago. It is larger than a bog pony, standing about 52 inches tall. Some are as tall as 58 inches. The Kunmara pony is strong and sturdy with powerful back legs. It is a mixture of Andalusian and Arabian breeds. The ponies are tough but agile. They run and jump well, even over rough ground. The ponies get this ability from being bred for the rocky landscape of Kunmara. The Kunmara Pony is the world's leading sports pony and is now bred all over the world for events such as show jumping. Missing Animals Because Ireland has been an island for thousands of years, the country does not have many animals. The surrounding sea has stopped species that are common elsewhere from reaching the land. For example, Ireland is famous for having no snakes. It has only two types of wild mouse far fewer than most places. The country also has just three types of amphibian, the common frog, the smooth newt, and the natterjack toad. The this toad is found only in a few locations in County Kerry. It is more common in southern Europe and was possibly introduced to Ireland by humans in the last thousand years or so. Although modern Ireland has few unusual animals, that was not always the case. In 1993, the footprints of an early land animal called a tetrapod were found in rocks on Valencia Island. The prints are 365 million years old and were made when the rock was still mud. Giant Hound There are several Irish breeds of dog, including the Red Setter, the Water Spaniel, and the Kerry Blue Terrier. The giant of them all is the Irish Wolfhound. The wolfhound is one of the tallest dog breeds in the world, growing up to almost three feet in height. Despite the dog's size and strength, the wolfhound has a peaceful and quiet nature. Wolfhounds have excellent vision. They were bred to chase foxes over open ground. Wolfhounds make good pets because they are quiet indoors. However, they do require a lot of space, exercise, and food. The wolfhound appears to be a very old breed. There is a record of it in Rome in 391 CE when Quintus Aurelius, the city's chief administrator, received seven wolfhounds as a gift. As with other animals, the wolfhound plays a part in many Irish legends. Comings and Goings Ireland's rich history began sometime after 8000 BCE, when Stone Age people arrived from Spain, France, and the Middle East. They brought stone tools, and they also knew how to farm crops for food. 
one of the world's oldest field systems still lies beneath a blanket of peat in County Mayo. In about 2500 BCE, copper and gold were introduced. Irish craftsmen made fine gold collars, necklaces, and earrings. The arrival of the Iron Age saw the emergence of the Celts. They are often referred to as the Invisible People because they left no written records. The Celts paved the way for a last wave of Celts known as the Gaels. They arrived in Ireland in about 700 BCE. Their language may have started the Irish or Gaelic language that still exists today. I'm going to read this part because I think it's neat. Archaeologists think that people reached Ireland in about 6,000 BCE. They lived on the coast and beside rivers where they could fish, hunt, and gather fruits. In about 3,500 BCE, people began to use stone axes to clear forest for pastures and farmland. Some experts suggest that battles described between different groups in an 11th century account called the Book of Invasions may reflect a conflict between Ireland's original hunter-gatherers and a new farming people. Archaeologists describe these new arrivals as Neolithic, meaning the New Stone Age. Neolithic people built stone monuments, or cairns, as tombs and for ceremonies. In about 1800 BCE, metal workers came to Ireland, attracted by its supply of copper. They mixed copper from Ireland with tin from Spain to make bronze, and beat Irish gold into moon-shaped necklaces and other ornaments. When the Celtic people arrived in 700 BCE, according to legend, they could not conquer the Tuatha de Danann, people said to make magical metal objects, so the Celts gave the Tuatha the underworld. The Tuatha became the fairy people of Irish legend. Superstitious Warriors some experts believe that a powerful force of Celts, originally from Central Europe, arrived in Ireland in 700 BCE, probably via Spain. The Celts knew how to work iron. Their iron weapons were superior to the bronze arms of the people then living in Ireland. Celtic or Gaelic culture became dominant throughout the island. The earlier people were not wiped out completely, however. Some experts even argue that there was no great arrival of Celts. They say that local people adopted Celtic ideas and language. In traditional history, the Celts were in awe of the original Irish, the Tuatha de Danann, who feature in Irish myths. The newcomers did not destroy the ancient cairns or mounds of stones, in case it disturbed the magical little people or fairies. This respect for ancient sites lasted in Ireland for a long time, but some sites are now threatened by development. The Iron Age Irish lived in family groups and circular forts. Some were stone, but most were earth banks, probably topped with a wooden fence. There are some 30,000 of these fairy forts in Ireland. Becoming Christian In the 5th century CE, Ireland became a Christian country. According to tradition, the religion arrived with St. Patrick in 432, who spent 30 years preaching in Ireland. Irish monks lived in monasteries, each one with a church, library, and workshop. The monks each had a small bedroom called a cell. Irish monasteries became centers of learning, crafts, and politics. After the Roman Empire collapsed in the 6th century, Ireland's Christians became isolated. The religion continued to grow there, while other areas of Europe were overrun by pagan peoples. Ireland became known as a land of saints and scholars. People went there to study, and Irish monks spread Christianity across Europe. Viking Plunderers The wealth of Ireland's monastery communities attracted a new wave of invaders, Vikings from Scandinavia. In the 9th century, Vikings attacked Irish coastal settlements. The raiders did not just plunder, however, they also set up trading posts. Most of Ireland's modern cities, including Dublin, Wicklow, Wexford, Waterford, Cork, and Limerick, began as Viking settlements. The Vikings and Celts clashed often over the next 200 years, but gradually the two communities merged. Peace was finally achieved when the great Irish king, Bramboru, united most of the country in the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. 1014. 
However, just as Brainboru gave thanks to the victory in his tent, he was killed by a retreating Viking. Norman Invasion Ireland once again broke into several small warring kingdoms. One leader, Dermot McMurrah, went to England to ask the Normans to help him win territory in Ireland. The Normans were Vikings who had recently invaded England from France. Dermot made an alliance with a Norman lord named Strongbow, who brought an army to Ireland in 1170. The Normans captured Waterford and Dublin easily. Their successes attracted the English King Henry II. He was worried that Strongbow would make himself Lord of Ireland. However, Strongbow swore loyalty to Henry, who took control of a large Irish territory called the Lordship. English Control Over the years, the Normans lost their lands in France and became purely English rulers. They also began to lose territory in Ireland and built castles to defend the most important places. By the 1500s, the English only controlled Dublin and a few other ports, and it looked like they would soon lose them, too. Over the next century, English armies were sent to take back land, and by 1603 they had conquered the whole island. At the same time, England was changing from a Roman Catholic country to a Protestant one. However, most Irish people were Catholics, and Protestant lords took away much of their land. That caused a rift that remained in Ireland for many decades. Controlling Laws Catholics, especially in Ireland, were seen as a threat to the British crown. In the 17th century, new laws were created to keep control. Catholics were banned from practicing their religion, and speaking Irish was made illegal. Catholics were not allowed to join the British Parliament, the armed forces, or work for the government or as a lawyer. They could not run schools, own houses, or buy land. An elder son could only inherit all of his father's land if he became a Protestant. Instead, Irish farms were divided between several sons and became even smaller. By 1776, 80% of the Irish were Catholic, but they owned just 5% of the land. Liberation, then disaster. A mass movement against anti-Catholic laws reached its height in the 1820s. It was led by Daniel O'Connell who organized huge, peaceful demonstrations. The discriminating laws were finally overturned in 1829. Less than two decades later, Ireland was shattered by its worst disaster, the Great Famine. Much of the food grown on Irish farms were sold abroad, and farm workers were not paid. Instead, they were given land to grow their own food. Most plots were only big enough to grow potatoes. In 1846, a fungus called potato blight killed most of the crop. Families went hungry. By 1851, a million people had died of starvation or disease. A further million fled to Britain and the Americas. The journey was wretched. The ships were overcrowded and full of disease. On some trips, as many as half the passengers died. People called the vessels coffin ships. Republican Rising Despite small improvements in the way Ireland was ruled from London, the calls for Ireland to govern itself continued to grow. The Irish Republican Brotherhood, or IRB, became influential. The IRB were also known as the Fenians, a name from the Fianna, a band of heroes in Irish legends. The IRB were involved in many violent revolts, the largest being the Easter Rising of 1916. On Easter Monday that year, armed Fenians occupied several buildings in Dublin. British troops ended the rising in a few days, but their violence increased support for a complete break with Britain. In 1919, the Irish Republican Army, or the IRA, was formed. A bloody guerrilla war began across the country between the IRA and the British authorities. In 1921, the two sides called a truce and peace talks began. The Irish Free State A treaty created the Irish Free State in 1922. The new country was ruled from Dublin but was still part of the British Empire. Irish citizens had to swear loyalty to the British King. In addition, the state only included 26 of the 32 Irish counties. Six counties in the northeast were home to mainly Protestant populations. 
they remained under British rule as the province of Northern Ireland. Over the next 25 years, the Irish Free State slowly loosened its ties with Britain. It stayed neutral during World War II. In 1948, it made a total break with Britain and became a republic. The Republic of Ireland, or Air in Irish, remained a nation of farmers with little industry. Many of its people still had to leave to find work abroad. However, rapid change in the 1990s improved the economy. The Irish are now the fifth wealthiest people on earth. Tradition and change. Ireland's mix of traditions and culture is celebrated in many stories and poems. Thanks to an economic boom in recent years, however, the country is changing quickly. Traditional practices have been replaced by modern attitudes and industry. Despite the rapid change, land, religion, and politics are still vital to much of life in Ireland. The Irish have a strong bond with their landscape. That bond shapes their attitude about preserving ancient sites, often out of belief that destroying them would bring bad luck. As a result, Irish culture is based on history. The past is very much part of the present, from Neolithic tombs to monasteries and castles. People also remember the long history of Irish rebellion. A nation of storytellers. Irish people have always loved stories. This tradition is a long one. Celtic bards were poets, storytellers, priests, and lawyers mixed into one. It was their job to record the history of Ireland. They recited and sang stories while playing the lyre or harp. Bards were very powerful. Everyone had to be respectful toward them. They could spread bad gossip about a person otherwise. Bards had disappeared by the 1600s, but the Irish have continued their love affair with stories. Four Irish writers have won a Nobel Prize for Literature, W.B. Yeats, George Bernard Shaw, Samuel Beckett, and Seamus Haney. Stories written by other Irish authors are also famous, such as Dracula by Bram Stoker and Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. James Joyce wrote several famous, although hard-to-read, novels, including Ulysses. And I have to point out, this is Owen Culver, who I had the great pleasure of meeting once and he was so charming and we took the time to chat and uh, he was just a great person. He wrote the Artemis Fowl books and many others. He's a great guy. Irish or English. Much of Irish literature in the past was written in the Irish or Gaelic language. Gaelic is the oldest written script in Europe after Greek and Latin. Nowadays, however, almost all of Irish writing is in English. About 14% of the population can read Irish, and only 30,000 people, less than 1% of the population, speak Irish as a first language. The version of English spoken in Ireland, however, is unique. If you listen to Irish people speak, you might think that only the accent and some words are different. In fact, the whole construction of the language is different. Linguists call the Irish dialect Hiberno-English. It is unique because Irish people still use Irish grammar to construct English sentences. For example, there is no word for yes or no in Irish. You can test this by asking an Irish person, Are you Irish? In Irish, they will answer, I am, rather than yes. In English, some Irish people will also say, I am. Loaning word. The Irish language has given many words to English. These are called loanwords, but they're here to stay. Whiskey may be the most famous. This word comes from the Irish phrase, I'm not even gonna try, meaning water of life. Ugh, I can say some Irish, but not all of it. Another loan word is phony, which comes from Irish immigrants selling fake gold rings or fun. The word boycott is not an Irish language word, but a man's name. Charles Boycott was a landlord who charged very high rents. His tenants refused to pay, and now this same sort of protest is called a boycott. Oscar Wilde, an Irish writer, said that the Irish are the greatest talkers since the Greeks, so it is no surprise that they also have given the world words for talking. 
If you have the gift of the gap, it means you are a good talker. The phrase comes from gob, the Irish word for mouth. What the Irish actually say is described as blarney. This comes from Lord Blarney, an Irish chieftain from the 1500s. He was asked to declare his loyalty to the English Queen Elizabeth I. He gave such a long, complicated answer that nobody could work out whether he was for or against her. Many tourists kissed the Blarney Stone at the Earl's Castle in the hope of gaining the gift of the gap. Making music. Irish music has its roots in ancient Celtic culture. Uh, Chanos, or old-style Irish songs, are traditionally sung by several people without musical instruments. Other types of Irish music are meant for dancing. They are played with pipes, harps, and other stringed instruments, such as banjos and violins. Dancers, generally in sets of four couples, dance a series of steps. Each set of steps has a name, such as Lady's Chain or the High Gates. Each dance is suited to a type of tune, such as reels, jigs, and polkas. There is a pause between each dance for the dancers to catch their breath. Irish step dancing is more of a solo dance form, although a form performed by large groups of dancers was popularized around the world by the success of the 1990s Broadway musicals River Dance and Lord of the Dance. That's so true. If you were alive in the 90s, you couldn't escape River Dance. <laughs> Modern Rockers. Traditional Irish music has a large following around the world through recording artists such as the Chieftains. But influence can be heard in bluegrass and other American roots, st roots music styles. However, the country's musicians have also been influenced by musical styles from abroad. In the 1970s, Ireland produced its own brand of pop and rock music with Van Morrison and Thin Lizzy. The biggest Irish musical success is U2, a 1980s rock band which continues to sell millions of records around the world. The most successful Irish bands in recent times are The Coors and Westlife. The Coors are awesome. Check them out. They are amazing. Westlife is okay. The U2 singer Bono is also an international charity campaigner, along with Bob Geldof, another Irish-born musician. Geldof had some musical success in the early 1980s, but is now more famous for his work organizing the global charity concerts Live Aid and Live Aid. And there's Enya up here. The queen. Sports and luck. Like people the world over, the Irish are big sports fans. They have top national teams in rugby and soccer, and have produced several world-class golfers. Horse racing is also a hugely popular spectator sport, with many people making bets on the winners. Horses spread in Ireland win races throughout the world. High speed games. There are also a number of sports played only in Ireland. Hurling is the oldest and one of the most popular ones. It has been played since the start of recorded history in Ireland 1500 years ago. A few fragments of a document from about 400 CE are thought to contain some of the rules of hurling. The game may be the world's fastest field sport. The ball can travel up to 100 miles per hour. Players use a huge wooden stick called a hurley, which is a little like a hockey stick, to hit or carry a small ball. They can also kick the ball or slap it with their open hand. Players can catch the ball and carry it for up to four steps. A player who wants to carry the ball farther has to bounce or balance the ball on the end of the stick. Players score by hitting the ball between H-shaped goal posts at the end of the field. A, bo a ball over the crossbar scores one point. Under the crossbar into the net, guarded by a goalkeeper, scores them three points. The women's equivalent of hurling is called kamogi. Kamogi. Its rules are identical to hurling, except women can also score with their hands. Hurling is an amateur sport. No one gets paid for playing hurling, even though the All-Ireland Senior Hurling Final is watched in Dublin by more than 70,000 fans. Changing Fortunes With few natural resources, the Irish economy was dominated by agriculture for most of the country's history. Even after World War II, when many countries were busy building factories, the Irish did not. 
Being an island made it expensive to import the raw materials needed for large-scale industry and even more expensive to export finished products. In addition to such practical problems, when Ireland became independent, many Irish had a vision of a self-sufficient nation, a land where farmers on small farms lived simple lives. But a few decades later, Ireland's economy was failing. The government had to change direction. Its plan worked, and today, Ireland is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Having a say. Modern Ireland is a highly democratic country, as well as electing representatives to the Dáil, the Parliament, and a president at regular interval intervals. The Irish are also asked to vote on certain important issues. These public votes are known as referenda. The Irish Constitution says that changes to the way Ireland is governed must be approved by a referendum. For example, Ireland's entry into the European Union was put to a vote in 1972. It was approved. In 2002, the Irish also voted to drop the punt, its original currency, and adopt the euro. As a traditional Catholic country, Ireland has a constitution that enshrines the importance of a family and of marriage. However, family life today is very different from how it was in 1937, when the Constitution was adopted. For example, about 30% of Irish babies are born to unmarried mothers each year. It was just 5% 25 years ago. Also, the Constitution made divorce illegal. However, in response to changes in social attitudes, a referendum voted to make divorce legal in 1997. Taking care. The Constitution also states that the government must look after the welfare of all its people and try to ensure a basic standard of living for all. There's Trinity College, one of the most amazing libraries in the world. The state provides free education, including college. As a result, 80% of young people have a degree. Health care, as with most countries, exists under both a public and private system. The Celtic Tiger When Sean Lemass became Taishok, or head of government, in 1959, he began the program for economic expansion to modernize the economy. Lemass wanted foreign companies to set up businesses in Ireland. To encourage them, he cut taxes and reformed the education system, to ensure that the Irish workforce could be educated and capable of doing any job. Wages were low in Ireland compared to other parts of Europe, so Ireland's workers were inexpensive but highly skilled. Eventually, the plan began working very well. From 1994 to 2004, the country had the fastest growing economy in the world. Ireland went from being one of the poorest countries in Europe to the second wealthiest. It was nicknamed the Celtic Tiger because its economic growth mirrored that of the Asian Tigers, South Korea, and Taiwan in the 1980s. American companies were especially interested in Ireland. Irish workers speak English, and they are on the western edge of Europe, just a short flight from North America. Three American computer giants, Microsoft, Intel, and Dell, located their European headquarters in Ireland, Many others were to follow. Modern Manufacturing Ireland specializes in industries that do not need huge imports of raw materials. They include electronics, pharmaceuticals, and biotechnology, which now contribute 75% of the country's total industrial output. Ireland is the world's largest exporter of software. It produces half of all the software sold in Europe's stores. Currently, 13 of the world's 15 pharmaceutical companies have factories in Ireland. Six out of ten of the world's top-selling medicines are made there. Crystal and Cows Agriculture, which was for so long Ireland's main source of income, has fallen in its economic importance. However, Ireland's largest natural resource is still its high-quality grassland. As a result, its agriculture is based largely on grazing animals, 
particularly cattle. The country produces huge quantities of milk and other dairy products. Much of this food is sold abroad. For example, Ireland supplies many Middle Eastern countries with beef. A few other traditional Irish industries remain. Waterford in the south is famous around the world for its fine glassware, known as Waterford Crystal. The crystal was first made in the city in 1783 and is now produced on a large scale. Crystal items are made by hand and they are found in several famous locations. The chandeliers in England's Windsor Castle are made from Waterford glass, as is the New Year's Eve ball that is lowered each year in New York City's Times Square. In addition, the winners of the nine annual Masters Series tennis tournaments are awarded with trophies cut from Waterford Crystal. Another famous Irish export is Guinness, a thick beer that is made from barley and is almost pitch black. Pouring a glass of Guinness properly is a skilled job. It is not a drink for the thirsty because the full process takes a little time. Land of Legends A glass of Guinness is just one attraction for tourists on vacation in Ireland. Others come to enjoy the amazing green landscapes littered with historic monuments. Tourism is an important Irish industry. It employs over a hundred thousand people who look after six million foreign visitors every year. Dublin is one of the most popular destinations in the world for shorter weekend breaks. People come for the crack, the Irish phrase for good fun. Many American visitors like to trace their family history in the country. Challenges and Opportunities Ireland's booming economy has created 30,000 new millionaires, but wealth has not always translated into better living conditions for all. Many communities are still poor and crime is on the increase. The new wealth has widened the gap between the rich and the poor. The population is rising, so facilities such as roads, hospitals, and schools are now stretched to their limits. They were once paid for with grants from the European Union, now that Ireland is rich, it must use its own money to maintain them. Ireland faces the future with mixed moods. It is confident after years of being a relatively poor country on the edge of Europe, but the Irish are also concerned about what other changes their future will bring. And that's the end of our book. My cat just woke up and he is eating his dry food, so, and my chair got really squeaky again. I don't know why. Anyway, I'm going to end the video <laughs> before my cat starts making too much noise, so thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope you have a very good, 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 good.